morning, everyone, and welcome to Crossroads Worship today. If you're worshiping online, we are glad that you are with us as well. And everything that happens in here is meant to happen in your home and in your heart as well. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 3, in the Bible, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We were talking this morning about how every Sunday in Lent is supposed to be considered a little Easter. And in fact, every Sunday is a little Easter because without the message of Easter Sunday and the hope we find there, we would have no need to gather on a Sunday morning. So hold that phrase in your mind, living hope. Maybe a word or a phrase will come to you in your own life. What does that mean to you to have living hope, actual, alive, vibrant, living hope as we worship together? Please stand as we begin to worship and pray with me. God of hope, we come to you this morning with open hearts, ready to receive what you have for us. Let your Holy Spirit work in this place and in each one of our hearts where we may feel downcast or discouraged, Fill our hearts with hope that we might be able to go back out into the world this week and serve you and serve the people around us. May we draw strength from this time together in community. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Amen. Let's sing together.
keep worshiping through singing. Put your hands together and clap along with us. Yes, you are. waiting for me. How about you guys tell people around you how glad you are to see them this morning before you sit down? Amen. I just got super into that last song. I was there with you. Hey, if I haven't met you before, my name is Tim Ward, and I'm the pastor here at Crossroads, and I wanna welcome you. 
I want to welcome you, whether you're here in person or online. We're so excited to worship with you today. We're in this season today called Lent. And I'm gonna talk about it a little bit, but the biggest thing I wanna tell you is this is a season of introspection, a time to look at our lives, to look at our spiritual lives, to take a deep dive, which we're gonna do over the next six weeks. So I wanna give you that context as we walk in today. I wanna encourage you, if you're here, to take out your worship guide. If you're online, you can go to crossroadsnova.org slash here. And inside, you'll find a connection card if you're here in person. Fill that out. In a little bit, the ushers will come around and you can place those in. It's really important that you fill that out either on the app or on the paper. And the reason that you do that is we pray for every single name we get. So if you fill it out online, we pray for you. If you fill it out on paper, we pray for you. If you do it on the app, we pray for you. And I just want you to know that you're being prayed for. I don't know everybody's story. I don't know everything that's going on. I don't know every little piece. But what I want you to know is that there are people who are thinking of you. So I just wanna share that with you. Crossroads is a church for all people. Doesn't matter what your background is, what your story is, where you are on your journey, we wanna journey with you. So I wanna tell you a few things that are coming up that are important, ways for you to get connected and to engage. One is that our middle school and high school students have an opportunity this summer to go on a mission trip, a trip to Philadelphia from June 18th to the 24th. It's called the Philadelphia Project where they'll get to do some real hands-on things to engage people maybe who are in different socioeconomic backgrounds than they are, to really take a deep dive into connecting with other people. So I hope that you'll think about doing that for sixth through 12th grade students. I think that's a really powerful way for students to feel like they're loved and connected. Second thing I wanna tell you about, it's really important to this church that people aren't hungry in our community. Many of us have been reaching out and finding from local organizations what some of the greatest needs in our community are. And one of the greatest needs is food. People are hungry. People don't have the food that they need. So we're gonna do school break bundles, which we've done in the past for uh, spring break, and that's for students in our local community. You can find out what all the elements are that go into there by going on our website, going to the table after worship. You can also give $30 for each school break bundle, and that will feed someone for two weeks. Isn't that amazing to think that $30 will feed somebody for two weeks? The way that we do that, it makes that work. So I wanna encourage you, participate in school break bundles, Frankly, if everybody who came to church here did that, we would make sure that no kids were hungry over spring break. And I don't know about you, but I'd love to be a part of that. Last thing I wanna share with you as far as information goes. If you've been coming to Crossroads for any time, you've noticed that we're growing. We have more people coming. That's a really exciting thing. Well, one of the things is I am uh, one person, and there are a lot of you. So we just found out in our system, we get somebody sent to us. We just found out that in July, we will be receiving an additional pastor at our church. So we will have two pastors, which is super exciting. Now, you may say that seems really weird. You're sent a pastor. Yes, that's the way it works in our system. But I will assure you that the person that they're projecting that we'll receive is a wonderful person that will be a great part of our team that has the same ethos that we do in this church about welcoming all people. And that was really, really important. So we will be able to uh, let you know who that is on April 23rd. So hold out for that date. It will come. We will share that. I know, it's such a strange system. But you will find out April 23rd, and we'll do that. But I'm really excited to have somebody else that will come and focus on caring for people and that will focus on small groups as well as new people. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be fantastic. Um, Speaking of new people, we have some new folks who are officially joining the church today and stepping into membership, and I want to invite them to come on up, though you know who you are as you come up. I want to tell you that at Crossroads, come on up, don't be shy, you can attend Crossroads forever and ever and ever. You can be part of Crossroads, just stand right up here forever and ever and ever, and never be an official member. But there are some folks who came and said, I want to take a deeper step. I want to take a more intentional step to be an official member of the church. What happens with that is, we ask them to take on more responsibility. We ask them to step into a more formal relationship. It doesn't mean that members are better than non-members. It means that it's a greater commitment. So I'm gonna say your name so people know you. You can see the names on the screen. Terry Drew, can you raise your hands? People see you. Patty Everett, Nora Murphy, Jerry Murphy, June Polson, and Carol Smith. So we're so excited. Yeah, we can clap for you. So I'm gonna ask you a question. And it's a question that leads to all these things that we just talked about, commitment. Will you be faithful to this church by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness to the world? And if so, say, I will. So now they're official. You can really, really clap for them now, it's official. Um, I know I say this every time, 
and it's really genuine, these are some of the finest people I know. Some of the greatest people I know, and frankly, it is a gift that they want to officially join our church. So thank you for the gifts that each of you bring, knowing that your gifts transform the greater community as well. The, um, Paul, in 1 Corinthians, talks about the church as the body of Christ, and how every part of the body is really important. Each of you is a part of the body, and each of you brings your own um, realities, your own journey, and your own story that makes our collective story better. So I wanna say a prayer for you. God, thank you for these people, for their lives, for their journeys, for what each person brings, God. Thank you for the people called Crossroads and the gift that we get to do this together. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a, a perfect moment in our service to give you an oppor opportunity as we have an opportunity as your worship team to pray for this church. And we're actually gonna pray in a song today because in the life of a church where we are, we're in a, a season of growth and people are telling us the thing they like about Crossroads is we're serious about welcoming all people, really, really serious about that inclusion. And we're serious about Jesus. And Jesus is the center of our church. In order for Jesus to be the center of our lives, we have to be intentional about that. It's kind of what the season of Lent is all about. So we're going to sing this prayer, and I invite you to stand and either say the words, sing the words, but in your heart be praying for your church, praying for our pastor, our pastors now, before one even comes, and praying for each other. Let's pray through singing. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end, it will always be. It's always been you, Jesus.
God, might this be our prayer. Christ at the center of our lives. Amen. Let me be seated. I'm going to invite Carol Smith to come up. And Carol's going to come up and talk just briefly this morning. I'm going to ask her a couple of questions. If you don't know, Carol's the executive director of an organization called Crossroads Jobs, which is a really important organization in our community that helps people move into a place where they have employment and employment that's sustaining. So Carol does a ton of work along with some others. So Carol, I wonder if you might start off just telling us a little bit about, I'm going to invite you over just into the light just a little bit. There you go. A little bit about the impact that Crossroads Jobs has on our greater community. Okay, well, thank you for this opportunity. And first of all, how many of you have ever looked for a job? Okay. <laughs> okay. And how many of you have ever had difficulty finding a job? Quite a few hands. Okay. So what we do at Crossroads Jobs is we really focus on assisting people who might have a barrier or experiencing a barrier to employment. Um, so that could be a language barrier, a disability, long gap, a gap in work history, that kind of thing. So we have two, we have five job counselors, two bilingual, one that is a retired special ed teacher. So she helps people who have, might have uh, neurodiversity. Um, and what we believe at Crossroads Jobs, and by the way, these are pictures of some of the folks that we've uh, placed in jobs, that's Benny. Um, we, we believe that people are wired to work, that we're all wired to work, that we wanna belong, we wanna be part of something. Um, and right now, we get a lot of questions. Okay, the unemployment rate's only 2.5%. Why, why are you here? Why are you doing what you do? But the need is great because there are many people who don't, aren't able to get from point A, looking for a job, to point B in front of an employer to get an interview. And so that's what we do at Crossroads Jobs. So we provide people with opportunity either in the form of helping with an online application, getting their resume looking good, interviewing practice, all that kind of stuff so that they can get in front of the, um, the employer. Um, and bottom line is we're, they are our applicants for life. So we really believe that, that we wanna move people up into a job that not only brings them hopefully some joy, um, uses their gifts, but also allows them to live in this wonderful county and you know, survive. So. so I know you guys have a ton of success stories. Like I hear about how many people you place every year and it's, it's really remarkable. I mean, truly, it's remarkable how many people this organization makes sure has jobs. Can you tell us one or two quick stories about people? Probably stick to one, just because I, otherwise I'd be up here for there's, a while. There's wisdom in that. Because <laughs> I can talk for a long time. So um, and we had one young woman who came to us a number of years ago who um, had had some, a run-in with the criminal justice system, really because she had experienced postpartum depression and she was from another country. Um, she actually tried to end her life with a small baby. And so her parents called the authorities and they were called in and they, um, she was charged with child endangerment. Um, they got it down to a misdemeanor, but it affected her ability to find a job. And so we walked her through the whole process, helped her get her first job, um, you know, the online application, making sure her resume looked good and also calling the employer, which is something we do answering any questions, clarifying things, talking about what a great person she was, which she is. Um, and she was able to get the job and keep it. And since then, with tools that we've provided, because one of the things we do is also provide people with really good, we believe, job search and job retention skills by workshops that we offer. Um, so she was able to keep moving herself up and she called recently and said that she had just bought a house. <laughs> so, wow. how cool is that? I mean, think for just a moment about the transformation that your organization brought to her life. I mean, to go from what she probably considers one of the lowest moments of her life to being able to call you, and she called. Yeah. That's remarkable to say that that happened. So, so how can we help? How can Crossroads help? She, she also called to see if we could update her resume. <laughs> so, so we will continue. Buying to a that. house means, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and getting another job, like a job closer to home, that kind of thing. So as I said, we're, we're, there are applicants for life, so people can come back two years later, three years later, if they need a little bit of help. So, yeah. How can you help? Okay. So donations are always welcome, especially recurring donations. We're really trying to work with people just like the church 
to say, hey, every month I can give $10 or I can give $50 or whatever is affordable. Um, we also are always looking for good board members. You know, we're a nonprofit, so we need to have a board of directors um, that I answer to in terms of like financial um, needs. And then any Spanish-speaking volunteers, are, we have offices in Sterling and Leesburg. Our Sterling office has two bilingual job counselors, but they are overrun right now. And they, you know, they can always use some help. Um, and also, be, with our neurodiverse population, we have found that job retention requires people to be on site after someone has been placed. And so if anyone has the heart to maybe be, do some job coaching, which means going to a place of employment working with our job counselor on what a person needs and making sure you know, that they get the, the support that they need. Um, and then gift cards. Um, and I know this is something that's gonna probably come up with anyone who comes in here to talk, but um, a, a lot of our applicants have transportation issues. So smart trip cards, smart trip cards, gas cards, um, target cards. We have um, what we call our Mary Tet Bridge Fund which is in honor of um, one of our board members' wives who passed away a couple of years ago. And it's to bridge somebody from where they're at to make sure they keep their job. So that's where the transportation and gas car, you know, that kind of thing helps. So. Awesome. so there are real tangible ways that you can support Crossroads jobs. What I want to tell you about your church is, the I think, I don't want to be wrong about this, I think one of the largest recurring gifts your church makes a year goes to Crossroads jobs. One of the largest gifts we give as a church is this organization because we believe in it, because we believe in the transformation that happens. So I wanna encourage you, frankly, I would imagine that you all couldn't do some of the work that you do without the financial gifts that come from Crossroads. Is that true? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, we started here. I mean, right. You notice the name is similar? That's, that a little reason. similar, right. <laughs> There's a, a reason little similar. for that, that uh, 12 years ago, I think it was, I, I you know came up before this church, talked about what I wanted to do um, and, um, and this church has been incredibly supportive. Yeah. That's amazing. So yeah. here's what I want to tell you about that. We do, every year we do an Easter offering and it's something where we ask people to give above and beyond their general giving because that blesses organizations like Crossroads Jobs. So I want to encourage you, give to the Easter offering. Give generously to it. You can go online and give all the ways that you can give. Normally you can give to the Easter offering too. And realize, friends, without giving to those sorts of gifts, without giving to our general and our Easter offering, we can't support things like this. That's changing people's lives. So I'm gonna invite the ushers to come up. They're gonna come and receive your connection cards. They're gonna receive your giving. You can give online too. But know that organizations like Crossroads Jobs depend on your generosity. Thank so you so thank much. You. Yeah, and I, I did get permission from the church to you know, borrow the name. There you go. <laughs> okay. His kingdom. 
the small become great and the last become first. Your kingdom is backwards. Lord, teach us to you might pray with me and for me. Gracious God, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth might be honoring and pleasing to you. God, that you would give us ears to hear exactly what you want us to hear this morning. As we enter this season of Lent, God, that you would speak into our lives. Open us up to receive the movement of your Holy Spirit. Transform our hearts so that we might love more like you love. Open our minds to understanding. Come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. So today we start in the season of Lent, and I mentioned that at the beginning of the service, and I have to be really honest with you, and I think I say this every time we enter Lent, I did not grow up in a church that really focused on this. I didn't grow up in an experience that did a deep dive for six weeks into our internal life, into our spiritual life. All I knew was that my Catholic friends celebrated Lent. And I knew that it had something to do with giving up chocolate, (laughs) not drinking soda, and eating only fish on Fridays. Right, that's really all that I knew, and I would hear people doing it, and and, and generally, and I kid you not, I felt like it was like a season of people being miserable. Right, because they couldn't have the things that they wanted. And it wasn't until much later in life where I went to a church that actually celebrated Lent and focused on it that I went, oh, this is about a reset. This is about a season for me to do some introspective work, a season for me to focus on my own spiritual life, a season for me to connect more with the person of Jesus as he wandered, as, as he spent time, not wandering, as he spent time focusing in the wilderness for 40 days. And that's what I'm called to do. So this is, I invite you into a season of reset, into a season of perspective, into a season of asking yourself deep and hard questions about your life. And I hope this is renewing for you. I don't know about you, but I want to get to Easter really quickly. I love Easter Sunday. I love the joy of Easter. I love the excitement of Easter. And yet here we are in this place where we wait where we focus on the person of Jesus and on our own spiritual life. So I invite you into that. For this time, we're gonna be in a series called John. And we're gonna look at the gospel according to John. And actually, after worship today, we have some books. There's, I don't know, 10 or 12 left that are for sale if you'd like to buy one. And that's the book that we're working through in this series. It's also what our small groups are using. If you haven't signed up for a small group yet, I wanna encourage you to do that. But the gospel according to John is a different gospel. There are four gospels, if you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three are very similar. They're often referred to as the synoptic gospels because it's likely that you will find many similar stories in those three. They start in slightly different places, but you'll find similar stories in those three. But then you get to the gospel of John and it's a little bit like uh, whiplash, right? You're like, this one's weird. 
This one's a little different. It's a little more mystical. It doesn't start in the same place. It doesn't really deal with the same things because really what the other three Gospels do is they tell you what Jesus did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're telling you the events, the things Jesus did, the way Jesus interacted with people. And the Gospel according to John tells you more about who Jesus is. You see the difference there? What Jesus did versus who Jesus is. So we're gonna dive into the personhood of Jesus. Now, what John's trying to convey to people, these are people who had a bunch of people who claimed to be the Messiah come before them. And over and over and over again, these people saying, I'm, I'm the Messiah, I'm the one who's come to save you, have come and they've sort of tricked them. And John is trying to say, this is the real deal. This one is the real one. So what John wants is for the people to trust this Jesus guy. So this gospel is all about trust. It's putting your trust in the person of Jesus. John wants them to know this is the one. You don't have to worry anymore about this one being fake. This is the one. Now, trust is a funny thing. I'm curious. You don't have to say this out loud, but I want you to think for a second. How many people in your life do you truly trust? How many people would you give all your trust to? Everything on every single thing. Would you trust with your bank account numbers? Oh, that's a big one, right? How many people would you trust with your passwords, with your search history, right? With your Amazon purchase list? Trust is a funny thing. The reality is trust is not high. In fact, there are many people who don't trust the people that they live with. So there's a study that came out, and this was back from 2018, so you can imagine since then trust has really changed because we've had a pandemic in the middle of it. And there's a trust barometer report that Edelman did. And I want to give you a summary of it. It says, trust in the U.S. has suffered the largest ever record drop in the survey's history among the general population. It fell nine points to 43%, placing it in the lower quarter of the 28-country trust index. So of 28 countries, we're in the lowest fourth in the United States for trusting people. The collapse of the U in the U.S. is driven by a staggering lack of faith in government. I'm sure that shocks everyone who's here, uh, which fell 14% to 33 points. The remaining institutions of business, media, and NGOs also experienced declines 10 to 20 points. Trust is like at an all-time low across. And in fact, most times in history, now this was in 2018, that was linked to some big economic downturn. But if you remember, 2018 was a high time economically. Things were good, so it's fascinating that it wasn't focused on a downturn. So what's happening with trust in our country? What's going on? I don't think it's that dissimilar from what was going on in the first century. We've been burned. We've been burned by people that we love. We've been burned by our government. We've been burned by people in our community. People say things about people. Trust is at an all-time low, and we struggle to know what to trust. We struggle to know who is trustworthy. We struggle to know who to put all of our faith in. And I was thinking years ago, I went to Yellowstone, and one of my favorite things to do in Yellowstone was to walk across, and you know I don't like heights, was to walk across a suspension bridge, right? You wanna talk about trust? Ooh, those cables, crazy other people that are on there with you that are moving because they think that's funny. That's not funny. And there's nothing funny about this. But you talk about trust. Walk across one of those things. Trust the engineer who's built it. Trust the physics behind the way that it works, even though it can't work, right? I want to encourage you to think about your life as those cables. What do you cable towards? What do you connect with? What are your cables in life that you hold on to, that you trust to, that say, I can walk across this bridge? I'm gonna give you some cables that we get today out of the first chapter of the Gospel according to John. I wanna look at it, and I'm gonna read 14 verses, which I don't often do, but I think these are really important to show you that Christ is trustworthy, that Jesus is trustworthy. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that's been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. 
the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John opens up this book in the very beginning, pointing to the one who is trustworthy. He opens this up saying, follow this one. Bet it all on this one. You can trust this one with all of who you are. So I wanna pull three cables, if you go back to that suspension bridge, I wanna pull three cables that I think we get from this text today. Three cables that make this mystical gospel according to John more tangible, that we can connect with, that we see. He does it in the very first line, he starts in the very first line. See, this one starts off differently than the other gospels. In Matthew, we start off with a genealogy, right? It starts off telling us, eventually you're gonna get to the person of Jesus, all the way back to Abraham and Sarah. Here's the way it goes. And Luke starts off with an angel coming saying, hey, really good news. Things are gonna be great. But John doesn't start off that way. John actually begins the gospel going all the way back to Genesis chapter one, the very first book in the Bible. John says, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that's been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. There's the first cable. Secret, he's talking about Jesus, by the way. In the beginning. Many people say, when does Jesus enter the picture? And people think, oh, it's when he's born. No, John says Jesus was there in the beginning, the very word of God. So the first cable is that Jesus is more than a great name. Jesus is not a great name to tell you this is the lineage of where he came from. It's not about that. It's not about the work qualifications that he has or even how he came into the world. John's not simply telling you that Jesus was a great man, a a, a prophet, a great miracle worker. John is telling you this is God. Jesus has come and Jesus is God. And you can actually see, smell, touch his hands. God is here in human form. John is saying the savior that I've been telling you about is God. He's the God of all creation. He was here from the beginning. He's come to bring light in the darkness. He's come in political unrest, in a time of real challenges. He's come to say there is hope. And John opens it up in the very beginning of the gospel. He says, make no mistake. God is among you. God is with you. Talk about confidence. John wants there to be no question that we can completely put our trust in Jesus. Why? Because he's God. It's as if he's saying, there's no reason for you to be confused. There's no reason for you to wonder because God is among you. It's like he's saying, come on, people. Don't miss the coolest opportunity you'll ever have to hang out with God, to spend time with Jesus. So the first thing is, Jesus is more than a great name. The second trustworthy cable is this that we get. Christ illuminates and solidifies God's love for us. What does that mean? Christ shines light on the fact that you are loved. If you are questioning whether you are loved by anyone else in the world, John says, stop questioning because God loves you. Look at verse nine here. 
the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Did you see all the qualifications in there? The true light that gives light to who? Everyone. Say that again. The true light that gives light to who? So does it say the true light that gives light to the people who have it all together? Does it say the true light that gives light to the people who meet our earthly qualifications? It says everyone. The true light that gives light to everyone. Friends, the craziest message that Jesus brings isn't a message about end times. You know, people come to me and say, why don't we study Revelation? You don't want to study Revelation. That's not the craziest message that's brought. The craziest message isn't about what Jesus is going to do. The most radical message that Jesus brings is that God loves everybody. Do you realize how crazy that message is? That is the most radical message in all of Scripture. God loves everybody. No buts, no ands, no preclusions. God loves everybody. And friends, this is important because it's important to know that you're loved. It's a basic human need. There's a hole in each of us that needs to be loved. Because when we don't believe that we are fully loved, we fear the other person. We fear saying the right things. We fear doing the right things. We fear telling them the full truth because if we tell them the full truth, they might leave us. Right, We fear telling our boss that we're terrified in our job because we're afraid we might lose our job. We're feared telling our spouse that we're not sure about our love or we're not sure about ourselves or we're not sure about the way our body looks or we're not sure about just take the thing. We're fearful to tell our kids we don't know what the heck we're doing in parenting because we're afraid that they might walk. Right? We're afraid for a moment that people might walk out on us. And the message of this is that there is nothing you can do that will make God walk away from you. There is no fear in sharing your full self. There's no fear because Jesus came for the full purpose of forgiveness, for the full purpose of grace, not for condemnation. Because while we often quote John 3, 16, we forget what 17 says. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Right? That's why Christ came. There's a study out about people who hold secrets. You know, most of us hold secrets. We don't tell everybody everything. And it's because of this fear of losing people often. And it says that most people are holding on to 13 secrets, five of which they've never told another person, ever. Some of you are adding up in your head, what are my 13 (laughs) secrets right now, right? We hold on to 13 secrets, five of which we've never told another person. And when they did this study, what they found out is people, the more secrets you hold on to, the more heavy and the more weight that you have. The more secrets that you hold on to, the more they burden you, the more they hold you down, the more they keep you from living. It shows that people actually feel physically heavier Michael Seppian, who's a professor at Columbia Business School, told The Atlantic, we found that when people were thinking about their secrets, they actually acted as if they were burdened by physical weight. Ooh, physical weight holding you down. They examined 13,000 real life secrets to figure out what people are keeping secrets about, what it's like to have a secret, and why secret keeping has overwhelmingly been viewed as a negative human secret. The secrets involve telling a lie, cheating on someone, harming someone, drug use, theft, violating someone's trust, sexual infidelity, secret hobbies. They found out that secrets were a form of imprisonment that holds you back. Friends, when we don't have anybody in the world that we trust to tell our full selves to, we're imprisoned. We're held back. There's a weight on us I mean, this is a scientific study, and John's gospel says, hey, you can tell your secrets to Jesus because he loves you, because his light doesn't come to shine brightly on your sin. His light comes to shine brightly on your life to let you know that you are loved. And that's the the other cable. The other cable is we are children of God. That's the third cable. And we get it right here in the first chapter of this gospel. We are children of God. We are God's children. Look at verses 12 to 14. It says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. There it is. We have that picture of being children of God. Now, if you go all the way back to the beginning, which this text takes us all the way back to Genesis, you see that God is the God of all creation, of every single child. If you go to Psalm 139, the psalmist says, and God knit me together in my mother's womb. We are all children of God, beloved. John used the phrase, the word made flesh in here. That's an odd concept. What does it mean? The word made flesh actually is the very phrase that deeply defines the promise that we find in John. The word that was with God, spoken from God in the beginning, a partner of creation, has now become human. God in human form, why? So that God could walk with us, journey with us, experience pain with us, experience emotion with us, and Jesus did it all. I mean, if you walk through the Gospels, you see the story, the life of one who walked through all of the different things that didn't sit like a king up in a palace somewhere, but walked and journeyed with everyone. Friends, what the Gospel of John gives us is a calling to identify your identity as a child of God. What if you woke up every single morning and you said, I'm a child of God? I am a child of God. I am a beloved child of God. I may not know where I'm going to work today, but I am a beloved child of God. My spouse and I may not be getting along too well, but I am a beloved child of God. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do in retirement, but I am a beloved child of God. I failed an English test last week, but I am a beloved child of God. What if? What if that's the message that we woke up with? So my calling, my invitation to you, John's invitation to you during this season of Lent is to pick out your cables to find how you're gonna link yourself to Jesus, to make the decision. And I gave some opportunities for that on Wednesday evening. I said, one is join one of the small groups that we're doing. Link yourself to Jesus along with other people. Choose that cable to link yourself. Another one I said that you could do is pray. Link yourself to Jesus. Remember I said prayer is more about us than it is about God. And maybe your prayer is, I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. Maybe that's your prayer. Come to worship every Sunday during Lent. Why? Not because we need more people in worship. But it's because I think it is in worship where we walk alongside other people. That we think about the cables that other people are connected with. Friends, this can really be life-changing. Whether you've ever received an experience in Lent or not, whether you've ever done it, whether it's about fish on Fridays and chocolate for you, I wanna encourage you to look at it differently this year. To take a deep dive into yourself, to take a deep dive, who you trust, how do you trust. Connect to those things. Hold tightly to those things. The one who came in human form who was here from the beginning, who came to bring life salvation to all, is here to meet with you this very day. John believes that a life with Christ will change your own life. And here's the thing, friends. I do too. Because it's changed mine. It's transformed mine. So we're gonna have a moment here. It's just gonna be a prayer. And it's a prayer for this season of Lent for you. And I pray you experience as we pray together.
our service today by receiving communion together. It's an open table. All are welcome. All can receive. There's nothing you can do that can earn coming to the table, and there's nothing you can do that'll keep you away. It's God's table. So I want to encourage you all to come. The ushers will direct you when the time is right, and you can come forward and receive. You can either get bread placed in your hand and dip it in a cup, or you can get one of the prepackaged cups and bread as well. There's gluten-free, prepackaged at each station, and there's a gluten-free station in the middle. On the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, as he sat around the table with the disciples, trying to show them who he was even more, he took bread, a common food, he gave thanks to God, and he broke the bread. And he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. As often as you eat bread, he said, remember me. When the supper was over, he poured into the cup. And he took the cup and he gave thanks to God. And he gave it to the disciples and he said, drink from this all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for everyone. For the forgiveness of sins, as often as you drink from the cup, Jesus said, remember me. Let's pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, on all of us here and online and over these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be the body of Christ for the world. Understand that we're redeemed by his blood. Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Thank you, God, for coming in human form, in the flesh, to walk amongst us for the movement of the Holy Spirit, which is poured over us, connects us, connects us in mission to the world, connects us in loving one another, connects us in spreading the message that we're all children of God. Holy Spirit, meet us here. Jesus name. Amen. I'll invite those who are serving to come forward and as soon as they're in place the ushers will direct you. Oh, 
Can we give a word of thanks to our worship team today? Thank you. Thank you. So I pray that that last line, Jesus Christ, my living hope, is what we all experience, each and every one of us, that we can trust in the one who came, 
not sometime 2,000 years ago, but that really came in the beginning of eternity from all time. There's a couple other things I wanna mention. We will have these books for sale if you'd like one after worship. I think there's 10 or 12 out there on the table. Go out for the bags for uh, school break bundles. They're out there. Also wanna tell you we have Pints with the Pastor coming up again. Woo! It's always exciting, right? March 5th, come out for that. That's right after worship. And then we have a spring cleanup day on the 18th. And I wanna tell you, there are a few ways that people have connected more in this church than coming to a cleanup day. So come, put it on your calendar. Kids are welcome, all are welcome. But go knowing today that you're a child of God, amen?